Welcome back. Well, uh, we're excited today to bring you a person who's sought out here internationally as a speaker, author, and trusted leadership advisor. His work has contributed to the building of accountable, vital, and engaged organizations across North America. As one of Canada's most respected voices on leadership and organizational culture, David has dedicated his life to helping build organizations that attract, retain, and unleash success by leading the authentic way. With more than 30 years of experience as an entrepreneur, workshop facilitator, professional speaker, psychotherapist, and advisor to executives, David has developed a unique personal and practical approach to transforming leaders. David is a best-selling author of seven books with over 300,000 copies sold worldwide. His most recent book, The Other Everest, Navigating the Pathway to Authentic Leadership, was just released this fall, and I read this book. It's interesting. I, I didn't quite have an, an idea of what kind of impact this would be, but um, uh, Lydia and I were uh, negotiating on a on a rec recreational property, condo, and uh, this had been going over a couple of years, this process. The, the seller kind of backed up last minute. I was getting a little frustrated. So this came up recently, about a month ago, contacted us and looked if we were going to buy this thing. And by this time, I'm so frustrated that I'm doing my typical, let's get on with it, and talking to lawyers. And, and then I read this book, <laughs> and there's this phrase that I, I took note of this, and, and, and it's, it said, they wrote that anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. <laughs> and I went, ah, that kind of makes sense. He went on to say, direction is more important than velocity. And so realizing that we're actually making progress in the negotiations, I backed off, and I'm delighted to say we now got a condo. And, uh, and thank you, David, uh, for that. We appreciate that. On a personal note, David is a formerly nationally ranked distance runner. He was Canadian, Canadian who trained with the U.S. National Olympic team, but today exercises more slowly. I guess that's the idea. He's a father of three and husband of one. Uh, David lives, lives with a wife, wife and family in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, right in Cochrane, where we got some folks. Please welcome Mr. David Irvin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Turn that mic on, that helps. How are you? Thank you very much for coming today. Thanks for letting me give an opportunity to, although you didn't have a choice on the, on the order of speakers, but I'm grateful and privileged to be able to start this day off after Jeff gave that great introduction. First of all, I want to tell you, I spend my life traveling around the country, the continent, working with a variety of companies. These are some of the organizations I've worked with over the last few years. I do leadership development. I have a four-day leadership development program. I'm an advisor to executives. Sometimes I'll hang out with, a, with an organization for three to five years. So whenever I only have an hour, I, I do executive coaching long-term. So whenever I only have an hour like this, I'm reminded of the words of Elizabeth Taylor to her eighth husband on their wedding day. Apparently, she turned to her eighth husband and said, don't worry, dear, I won't keep you long. <laughs> so I won't keep you long today, but I will promise to keep you engaged. I want to say there's some incredible leaders in here that I know personally. Sean, Denise, you know who you are. Uh, some people, Sean came all the way from St. John's, New Brunswick. Um, but I got to tell you, there's a person in here who will be in my heart for the rest of my life. Suzanne, would you stand up? So Suzanne taught my daughters how to swim. So like you can't get any more important role. So Suzanne, let's give Suzanne a round of applause. So we all lead in different ways. And my job is to remind you today, you're going to hear a phenomenal group of people who are going to give you ideas, strategies, tools. But all of that hinges on one thing that I'm going to remind you in this next hour. All of that, all the techniques that you learn, will hinge on one thing, and that is, how do you show up in the world? How do you show up? How do you lead with your presence? It has nothing to do with a title. It has to do with who you are as a person. Now, let me give you an example of this. Jeff, where'd you get to? 
there is a guy. I only know about half the speakers here. But I knew it would be good. And I knew every one of those speakers would be good. Why? Because I trust Jeff. And if Jeff does not, is, I know Jeff is not going to hire slouches. <laughs> the guy is on the top of his game. How many people here came because you trusted their opinion? They, as, a ref, as a referral. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you did that? You, you might want to even wonder, how did I end up here? Where did that trust come from? Now, let me tell you about Jeff. See, whenever we refer clients back and forth, and I never take a referral fee because I just want to create value for clients. So I referred Jeff to a client up in Fort McMurray. A week later, after he spoke to this client, I get, I get a, a gift certificate. He found out what kind of restaurant that my wife and I he dad sent me a $200 gift certificate. Now, where did he learn to do that? Is that, did he learn that at a, a customer service technique? Was that a technique? I'm gonna argue and submit for your consideration, it's who he is. It's how he shows up in the world. It's who he is as a person. I was down doing a board retreat in San Francisco not long ago. We had customer service at every level. Every interaction was a wow experience. And as I'm checking out, I ask the front clerk, do you folks get customer service training like rigorously? Because we had superb, consistent cons customer service at every level. And this young, enthused customer service representative sat back and she said, you know, I haven't really thought about it, but you can't train somebody to be nice. What we do is that we hire nice people, and then we train them how to use the computer. <laughs> that, to me, is where we get customer service. You can say, I, it's one of those things. Leadership is what I'm going to talk about this morning, and customer service is, is not something that can be taught. It can be developed. It can be fostered. It can be, as my dad would say, caught but I'm not sure that it can be trained or taught. There's a woman on our team back there, Barb Capre, Capre, and she is a person who will lead from the back, but you can count on Barb to be here. She will be here, she, you can sleep at night because you know if she says she's gonna do something, she'll be there. How do you show up in the world? That's what we're gonna reflect on today. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to form three questions to form this presentation. Three questions. Number one, what is a healthy organization? No matter what techniques you learn today, no matter what tools you go back, it's not going to mean anything if you've got an unhealthy organization to work in. Would you agree? Number two, we're going to ask you to look at how is your leadership impacting the health of your organization? Every single person is a potential leader and potentially contributes to the health of their organization. Number three, I'm going to talk about how authentic are you as a leader. Guess what leadership is in its very simplest forms. It's a person who has followers, not followers on social media, necessarily. Not followers in the old sense that says, you know what, you've got to follow me because I'm the boss. But followers because you get inspired by being around those people. And where does that capacity to be followed and trusted come from? It comes from being real and being authentic. From my research over the last 20 years, what we've heard in interviewing thousands of people, what do, we ask people, what do you want from your leaders? And what they want from their leaders is what they want from themselves, which is this. We want our leaders to get past the fads and the gimmicks and the flavors of the month. We just want our leaders to be real. People will not follow you unless you are authentic. But you see, authenticity has taken a bad rap these days. People walk around like a jerk. So, well, it's just my authentic self. No, that's not your authentic self. That's your adolescent self. See, there's three selves going on. There's an accountable self that shows up in the world. Then there's an authentic self that comes from your deepest heart the person you are meant to be in life, the person you are born to be, 
We are born as a seed of possibilities, folks. Just like an acorn seed is destined to be an oak tree. You are destined to be something in your life when you're born. You can be unemployed, but you can't be uncalled. We're called to something. When you align your life with that, then you're authentic, and that's where the deepest part of engagement comes from. Number three, there's a third part of ourself. That's the adolescent self. That's the self that just seeks pleasure, that just wants to, whatever, you know, is impulsive. Be careful when you say, well, I'm authentic. Well, which self are we talking about here? You've got to look a little deeper than that. All right, let's talk about a healthy organization. This is work from Patrick Calencioni's work, adapted from Patrick's work. He talks about there between a smart organization and a healthy organization. By the way, the emphasis will always be on smart. Just evaluate your own organization. By the way, you can evaluate your own family around this. Doesn't matter what you call an organization. It could be a nonprofit group, nonprofit organization. It could be an entrepreneurial organization. It could be a, a large department. It could be a small department. But I'm going to ask you, how smart are you? Now, here's what smart looks like. Strategy, finance, innovation, technology, process improvement, execution, and operational excellence. That's smart. Nothing wrong with smart. Would you agree? You got to, you know, if you're not going to do that, you're not going to make it in organizations today. Public service, private sector, doesn't matter. You've got to be smart. But you know what? There's a difference between smart and healthy. Here's healthy, safe and caring. Do your people feel safe? Now, we all, you know, you, if you don't talk about physical safety today, you're not going to be in business. Now, I'm a farmer. When you get these slides, by the way, you're going to get a little C with a circle around it. You know what that means? Copyright. You know what copyright means? That means you have a right to copy it. I'm serious. You just throw this stuff out. I'm just a farmer. I just throw out seeds. I never know, but I feel, but I'm honored if you'd send it around. Pass it around. And there's nothing that brings me more joy than if you take these slides, this material, and go back and talk to your team about this. Anyway, safe. We talk about physical safety. Of course you've got to be physically safe, but how about psychological safety? Do people feel safe to be who they are? By the way, you can measure the health of a marriage. This is marriage 101. When you go home tonight to a significant other, spouse, do you feel safe? Is it a place that you can be who you are? How many of you ever work in a place where you have to leave who you are at the door? And you come in and try to be somebody else. Do you feel safe to make mistakes? Or are you walking on eggshells all the time? What happens to your productivity? What happens to your engagement? If you don't feel safe to be who you are, Caring. Do people care? I was coaching a guy the other day. I was, he was, hire, I was hired to coach this guy from this, by the CEO. So we got a senior executive. He's, his performance on his team has diminished significantly in the last year. And we want to assess if we've got the right person in the role. And would you just help us assess that? For the first 10 minutes in the session, all I heard was this guy complaining about the younger generation and they don't have a work ethic and they went on and on and on. And I tolerated this for about five minutes and then I said, I just got a question for you, do you care? He says, of course I care, we're not getting results on our team. Then he went on and on and on, on another rant. And I said, no, you didn't hear my question. Do you care about what those employees go home to at night? Do you care about their families? Do you care about their values? And he sat for 10 seconds, probably the first time I got some honesty out of him in the last 10 minutes, and you know what he said? Not really. I'm just trying to get them to get their job done. I said, why don't you do your organization and your employees and yourself a favor and get the heck out of management? You don't belong here. Get, take a break from it. Take an honest, look yourself in the mirror. People will cut you a lot of slack if they know what? That you care. But if, they don't, if you don't care, you don't have a hope. Number, number two, high trust, energy and engagement, minimal confusion, minimal politics, high morale. So here's a little test you could do with your team. Let's suppose this is your team. Go back, we won't have time to do it today because we've got an hour. But you can go back with your team and now pick a number between 1 and 10, how healthy is our team? You can do this if you really want to be risky on this. Do this just with your marriage. How healthy is our relationship on a scale of 1 to 10? Now, 1 would be 
in, your, in a team environment, that'd be toxic. Hey, when I come to work, it's like poison. I get sick being here. By the way, can an organization make you sick? 100%. But I don't ask a law firm yet. This is a yes. This is just need to know you're kind of awake here. <laughs> or a 10 would be, geez, I'd rather be here than at home with my marriage. Right? So that's a 10. And then just go around the room and say, what number would you give? Now here's a question for you. What's the ideal number? What are you shooting for? See, health of an organization is like the health of a person. You can be really, health, you can be really smart, but if you're not healthy, you're not going to have the energy to do what it takes to be smart. So it's going to take an impact on you. It's going to make an impact if you're not healthy. You know what I learned walking my brother through the cancer journey for three and a half years till he died? You know what I learned? When you got your health, you got a thousand wishes. When you don't have your health, you got what? One. Health is very precious, the health of an organization. Creating a healthy culture. So what's the ideal number? Well, here's the, uh, the, uh, the answer is, when you go around the room and talk about your rationale for giving an, uh, your number, here's the deal. Is that a polite conversation or is that genuine? I would far rather have a genuine three than a polite eight. You know the opposite of engagement is not disengagement. You know the opposite of engagement is? Polite. Well, I mean, we're Canadians after all. Yes, we're polite, but you know what? We've got to get beyond polite. Is this real? Can people feel safe here to take accountability for that number and honesty about that number so we can work together on improving that health? So that's one of the things we do. And what, I mean, I, I developed a list of values with an executive team the other day. Actually, it was earlier this year, but we've been working together this last six months. Now, on the top of their values, you know what it was? Respect. Well, we want to be respectful around here. Everybody's, how many of you understand there's a difference between values and value statements? You can have value statements, but you don't really have value. Have you ever been to a hotel and said, we put customers first? Then you talk to the clerk. Did this person read the mission statement? Did they read the values? They got the statement, but they don't have the values. So the respect up there. Okay, okay yep, we're going to be respectful. So I say, my next question is, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable for being respectful? All the heads go down. I said, what's going on? What about Chuck? I said, what about Chuck? Well, we got a problem with Chuck. He's our best salesman. I said, what's the problem? He's the most disrespectful guy in the whole team, probably in the whole organization. He leaves a wake of disrespect everywhere he goes. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, we can't fire him. He's bringing in all the money. He's, he, he sells more than our entire sales team put together. We can't, we can't fire him. I said, you don't have to fire him, but see that's respect up there? You've got to be real about this. Just take that respect, put a line through it, put profit up there. That's what you guys value. Let's not lie to people. No problem. Just say, you know what? We don't value respect here. We value profit. If you want to work it, now we know where we stand. Don't, co don't come and work here if you want a respectful place. You want to make money? Come work here. Be honest. Be authentic. Guess what they did? Fired him. Until your values are tested under pressure, you will not know what your values are. Guess what happened to the rest of the sales team? We all stepped up to the point. It finally, now we're going to start to really do something around here because people are not just walking, just talking the talk. Now we're actually going to do something. We're going to hold ourselves accountable. All right. Your health of an organization is like the health of a person. It's one of those things that's important, but it's not urgent. It's not urgent. Our technology, and Jeff mentioned this, so this is what I learned from Steve Covey, and he got it from back in 1970s. I took a course from Steve Covey at university, and then he took this whole philosophy of important from, and, and urgent from a guy named Charles Hummel, who wrote a book in 1967. Basically, Charles Hummel said, urgent demands push on you, important demands you, you push on. Guess what, folks? Technology today has made access the urgency so, so prevalent in our lives, we've forgotten what's important. You see, we can put that into zones where we have distraction is zone one. That's urgent and not important. By the way, urgent or important take care of your health. Important, before you end up with a heart attack. Important, but it's not urgent. You don't take care of your health, guess what happens? It's going to one day become urgent. 
Got to make it a priority. Middle one is necessity. You know what I believe? Then, the, then you have fulfillment. That's where important is. That's where waste is. Neither urgent or important. What happens in our lives is that the necessity. Our lives are consumed with the necessity. Urgent and important. Leadership is in that little realm over there where we begin to really say what's important. You've got to make it a priority to have health in your organization. Now let's talk about the difference between a boss and a leader. How many of you understand that? How many of you ever had a boss that wasn't a leader? You don't have to put your hand up in case they're sitting beside you. <laughs> Here's what a boss is. You got a kid, you got a child, 10 year old. A boss, sometimes, by the way, it's not, it's not wrong to be a boss. We all need bosses. It's a tool though of last resort. Sometimes you've got to say to that 10 year old, you know what, you can't pick up that device until you've read for 10 minutes. Sometimes you've got to draw a line. Agree? Here's what a leader is. A leader will inspire that kid so much they'd rather read than pick up the device. That's a whole different process. So my question is, where's the energy in your organization right now? You don't get promoted to being a leader. Nope, you can't get promoted to being a leader. You get promoted to being a boss. But you've got to earn the right to be a leader. You don't need a title to be a leader. So what's the difference between a father and dad? Every person here had a father in their life. Not everybody had dad. What's the difference? You understand the difference between a father and dad, mother and mom? You begin to understand the difference between a boss and a leader. It's about investment. It's about commitment. And if you're, you know, just don't just take these techniques. These tools are going to be great tools here. But don't you just go back there without looking yourself in the mirror and saying, how invested am I in this relationship? Do I care enough to invest in this relationship? I can't talk about leadership without talking about my father and my mother. They're the first leaders in my life and they're first leaders in all of our lives. And most of us today lead the way we were parented. Now, if you lead better than you were parented, it means you've worked on yourself. You've got to be intentional about that. I can't talk about leadership without talking about my dad. My dad was the Canadian gymnastics champion in the 1940s. He used to walk around the house on his hands. I didn't think there was anything particularly unusual about that. <laughs> Until I had friends come over and they said, geez, that's pretty cool. I said, I guess so. I never thought of it as a gift. It's just kind of what we grew up with. There's my favorite picture. That's on top of Mount Yanuska. Can you imagine the strength of his core muscles? It's core muscles, not balance. I've learned that from my dad. It's core muscles. That's on top of Mount Yamneska. See that tip up there, right there? That's where that picture was taken. My dad was crazy. He used to take me down to the gym every Saturday morning, try and turn me into a gymnast. Now, when, the, when you're in elementary school, the, the bars are this tall. I never in three years lifted my, developed the strength, lift myself up on those bars. My dad finally gave up on his dream to make me into a gymnast, but he never gave up on his dream to help me find my gift. To this day, I can close my eyes. My dad's been dead since 1986 when he died suddenly of an aneurysm. And I can close my eyes today and I can still smell my father. L feeling the strength of his biceps gently lifting me up on those parallel bars. You tell me how you're going to get that over an internet today. It's about investment. He finally found out I had a passion to run. He inspired me to we have a dream to make the Canadian Olympic team in the 1980 Olympics. Got me up, became my track coach. If I was not a bed in five minutes, my dad would be in my bedroom on his hands when I was in high school. Hard to argue with a guy on his hands. <laughs> Leadership lesson. Number one, be passionate. He was passionate. Number two, he cared deeply. Number three, he modeled. He didn't expect anything from me that he was not prepared to do. He would walk along the side of my bed, flip around, grab my feet, proceed to give me a lecture. I called them lectures in those days. Then I had kids, I called them teaching opportunities. <laughs> I can still, to this day, hear my dad's voice. David, the purpose of having a dream is not to achieve your dream. The purpose of having a dream is to inspire yourself to become the kind of person that it takes to achieve your dream. He said, very few people ever make the Olympics, and even fewer will stand on the podium, but anybody can become the kind of person that it takes to get there. And if you're going to become the kind of person that it takes to get to the Olympics, young man, you need to declare your independence from two things. Number one, a warm bed. Now get up. <laughs> if you can't put your feet on the floor in the morning, whether you feel like it or not, you will never make an Olympic athlete. 
Then I'd be heading out the door, dragging my rear end. It's 30 below. Can't see the end of our driveway. I'd be heading back to bed. My dad would be standing there and says, the second thing you need to declare your independence from is the weather. There's no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad clothes. Now go get a run and you'll feel a lot better about yourself. <laughs> Teaching me how to show up and be accountable. My mother, I can't miss an opportunity to give tribute to my mother. My mother was a minimalist long before the word was even invented. Ten kids were raised in that shack six miles outside of Lethbridge. My mother taught me always let your gratitude be bigger than your circumstances. There wasn't one ounce of entitlement in my mom's bones. There were months that all she lived on was carrots and potatoes while her father worked three jobs through the Depression. You know what, we can talk about hard times in Alberta. I don't think we know hard times. I don't think we know hard times. It's a challenging time. We've got to respond differently. We're going to learn some tools at how to do that today. But let's, let's be grateful. My mother in her will, by the way, what would you rather get from your parents? A rich financial inheritance with no character and values or character and values and no money? Guess what I got? My mother died broke. I got no money. She spent all my inheritance, as she should have. Guess what I got? I got her character and values. Number one, in my mother's will, number one was she wrote to me, to my son David, I leave my passion for learning. I got her library. And in my library, I have a book that was written to me, to sign by my mother, rather, in 1930 by a woman named Nellie McClung. Wow. Woman of true character. Number two, I got her piano. I got the piano and her love for music, her old Heinzmann piano. Number three, I got her quote book. My books are filled with her quotes. And in her quote book, I found this quote, maturity, the ability to do a job whether or not you're supervised, finish a job once you start it, carry money without spending it. Well, two out of three is not bad, huh? <laughs> And finally, number four, be able to bear an injustice without wanting to get even. What she taught me was maturity doesn't come with age. It comes with the acceptance of responsibility. Three things I learned from my parents. Don't ever make a promise you don't intend to keep. Number two, see all blame as a waste of time. And number three, do more than you get paid for. The most important contributions you make in the world do not come with a paycheck. All right, now let me give you my list of what I believe is a transaction. It's a life job versus a life. By the way, ask yourself, where are you putting your energy today? And if you're not intentional about this, you'll get sucked into the tyranny of the transaction. And life will become a transaction because that's where all the pressure is. That's where the pressure of your, of your, your shareholders that's where the pressure of your organization, it's where the pressure of your customers. But you've got to be smart enough to realize that you've got to spend half of your time, your energy on the, other, on the life, on the uh, transformational side, on the leadership side, a job versus a life, a position versus a presence, task versus a person, purpose and a passion. Martin Luther King did not stand up in 1963 and say, I have a strategic plan. I have a dream. Why do you get out of bed in the morning? You know the number one reason why I hear people get out of bed in the morning is to pee. Well, that's a good place to start. What gets you up early? What keeps you up late? What inspires you? What is your dream that you bring to work? Well, I don't have a dream. I'm just doing my time. Well, that's, you're just caught in the tyranny of the transaction. By the way, do you need a title to have a dream? No. Seems like, well, I'm going to come make this world a better place. You've now, you've now stepped into the transformation. Enforces versus inspires, manages versus mentors, performance versus people, control. You get a sense of what I'm talking about here? Policies versus values, action versus awareness. By the way, you don't have to tell people that you have flaws when you're in a position of leadership. Don't have to be vulnerable about all your flaws. Why not? Because people know it. You get a position of leadership, guess what? You just magnified every one of your faults. Here's what you've got to tell your people. You've got to let them know that you know what they know. <laughs> Don't go hiding it. You might not be a people person. You might, not, you might be a better boss than a better leader. No problem. Just be honest about it. You know what? I'm not a people person. My strength is I'd rather work with numbers than work with people. People are kind of a pain in the neck to me. 
I have to learn how to deal with people, but you know what I realize? I got Chad here on my team, and he's a people guy. So I'm going to support him to do the people stuff, because I know how important it is, even though I'm not good at it. That'll earn credibility. Now you're authentic. Now you're real about it. Now I got a little transformational. So by the way, this is as simple as going to the grocery store. You go to the grocery store, guess what cashiers have on their chest? A name tag. Guess why they have a name tag? Because they have a name. Guess why they have a name? Because they have a story. With a name comes a story. Now you can treat that like a transaction. You can pay for your groceries, you leave, they have, you know, they take the they take your visa card, you take the groceries. Transaction. End of story. Is that what we want our life to be relegated to? Is one transaction after another transaction? Do we want, do we want on our headstone, well, we checked off the boxes? Or do we want to make a difference? You know, in 30 seconds, you can make a difference to a cashier's life? Just cheer that person up. Help them feel like they're important. Encourage people. You want good customer service, you've got to give good customer service. You walk into a store and say, well, I, I have a right to customer service. No, my mother would say, every right comes with a responsibility. We don't have a right to customer service. You give what you want. Be careful what you give out in the world. It'll come back to you. You want better service, be of better service. So I got a little RCMP story. I work a lot with the RCMP and a lot with police agencies. And 12 years ago, I'm driving downtown Cochrane in Griffin Road, and the police go, the lights go on, and I pull over. And a young constable stands, walks up beside my car. And I said, officer, I was very certain I was not speeding. I was really intentional about not speeding. He says, you weren't speeding, but see that stop sign back there? You just roll through that stop sign. I said, well, you better give me a ticket. Now he comes back, young constable, probably in his early 20s. He says, before I give, now by the way, this is a potential transaction. He takes my registration, he takes my license, he gives me a ticket, I pay the ticket, we get on with our lives. And it's a check the box. I checked the box, I paid the ticket, he gave the ticket, he did his job. But no, this particular constable stepped into leadership, and he stepped into leadership with one question. Do you know what he said? Would you like to know why I'm giving you this ticket? Now we're talking about a leader. Why? Why give me a ticket? Just so we can make more money in our coppers for the community? Maybe. But maybe there's a bigger reason. And I said, well, sure, give me a reason. He got my attention. He was silent for 10 seconds. And I looked up at him. You folks from Cochrane would appreciate this story. I looked up at him. And he had tears in his eyes. Ever see a constable with tears in his eyes? And he kind of apologized for losing his composure. And he said, I just came from a four fatality accident where four dead children had to be removed from the back seat of a van because somebody went through a stop sign. And I would not want that to happen to you. Now, I'm going to tell you for the last dozen years, I, will, I, I won't lie and say I've never gone through a stop sign, but nine times out of ten, I'll think of that officer. And he has no idea the impact that he has. Every time I tell a corporate audience that story, I've had, I have had letters, emails come to me about how that helped people be a safe driver. How long did it take for that transaction, transformation to happen? 30 seconds. And it changed the life. Now, I'm talking to the district commanders, to the detachment commanders in the East Central District of the K Division here in Alberta last year. And I told them that story. And I said, you know what? One day I'd love to be able to meet that officer. I have no idea who he is. I'm not even sure when. Well, I'm talking to the, I'm talking to the RCMP. Ten minutes later, I get a note from one of the officers in the room that says the, the officer who wrote that ticket, it was, it was written on April the 8th, 2008. It was written by a constable named Mark Seaman. He's still in Cochrane. You can contact him and let him know the difference he made in your life. And here's his email address. Transformation.
And so here's what I'd like you to do. We can make this a little bit more interactive now if I've got a little more time. What I'd like you to do is turn to an elbow partner. And what I want you to do, just the person sitting beside you, would you just take two, three minutes and talk about where do you spend your energy as a leader? I don't care what your title is. Where do you spend your energy? Are you spending too much of your time in the transaction of your job? How is your leadership? How is the opportunity? Because you're, you're going to have to fight for the transformation, or at least be intentional about the transformation. How is the balance in your own leadership? By the way, this can be related to parenting. <laughs> for those of you who are parents, it's really hard to be a leader in your home when you've got to get your kids to get their darn homework done. Agree? That's why we have grandparents. Because <laughs> they don't have to be the boss anymore. They get to be the leader. It doesn't have to be you that does the leadership. Maybe it's not your strength. Maybe you're caught in the weeds right now in your organization and you're just are caught in the tyranny of that transaction. But where is that balance? Just no judgment. My, my definition of awareness is observation without condemnation. Just observe where you're at on that balance and notice the result. Have a conversation with each other for five minutes. Just the person sitting beside you, would you? Thanks. Thank you for engaging in that. Thank you for talking to each other and for showing up today and for investing in this today and your development. Do I have any, quest any questions? Are there any questions or comments or reflections? I know it's a big group. Just kind of have to pretend it's a small group. But I'm happy to enter, stop and entertain a question or two. I, I really... My, my mother, who's Irish, would, would call this a one-way an, an Irish conversation, one way, right? So I really do appreciate when I can speak, I like to have some dialogue, because there's so much wisdom in this room, and it's presumptuous of me to think I can stand up here and give you all this wisdom. I'm just giving you one perspective of, you know, 100 in here plus. Any thoughts or questions or reflections so far? Make sense? Yes? If you find yourself too busy that you're a boss, Oh, it's a beautiful question. Everybody hear that question? What I, by the way, how many of you can relate to that question? We all get, thank you. See, you just spoke for the whole group. It's beautiful. We all get so busy being a boss. And it's true in parenting. It's true in everything. We just try to manage results and man, without realizing that the foundation has to be built on health. First of all is stop and recognize that every day. What is my priority? Slow down. We're going to talk about strategies for authenticity in a few minutes here, and that will fit into one of those strategies, which says, you know what, pause every day. Stop and go inside and say, you know what, where, where is leadership required this week? Start to schedule your week. We're on Sunday night or Monday morning or Friday afternoon when you're looking at your week ahead. Stop and ask that question. Where is leadership required? And start to schedule in. It might be a relationship with an important person in your life. Outside of work, a, a friend. It could be a relationship with a significant other. It could be a relationship uh, with your team to say, you know what, I just need to carve out one morning this week to start to do a little leadership. And you know, as Jeff read, it's direction, not velocity. You don't have to start, if, you know, if that's 5% of your work right now is leadership, or maybe 0%, start to say, where can I increase that in the next week to 5%? Just start small. It's direction, not, not velocity. And your team will appreciate your efforts to do that because they'll know you care enough to put some of that urgency aside. That's the short answer to your question, but I'll be around all day to have more dialogue. Come up and tell me your stories, and, and I'd love to have a longer conversation with you. I'm going to show you a little video. Now that I've got a little extra time, we're going to go till 10 after 10. So I've got a little extra time, so I'm going to show you a video. Now, this video has nothing to do with your leadership, and it has everything to do with your leadership. Because this is leadership at its finest. And your job, while you see this video, is to identify who are the leaders in this video. This is leadership in an unexpected context, not with a title, but with a presence, not with a position, 
Although the position is there, the position is used to build a person, another human being, through their presence. But their position is not their power. Their presence is their power. And I want you to watch for that presence. But there was also a myriad of other leaders to observe. Your job, as you watch this three-minute video, is to observe who are the leaders and what qualities of leadership do you see demonstrated in this three minutes? And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. Mo Cheeks, former coach of the Portland Trail Blazers. Folks, what leadership qualities did you see exhibited there and who were the leaders? Have another quick conversation. I'll just let this go on for about one minute. What, what did you notice? Who were the leaders and what qualities of leadership did you see exhibited? Have a conversation with back with your elbow partner, will you? Can't give you a lot of time to talk about that. Can I just hear three qualities? First of all, who are the leaders? The coach, obviously a leader, the coach, stepped up, stepped up when nobody else did. By the way, if you notice how far he had to walk, he stepped up pretty quick. There's a leader. Who else? The crowd. The crowd was a leader. They led to say, you know what, we're going to help you succeed here. You can lead from behind. Who else was a leader? Obviously, the young lady was a, was a leader. Any other leaders that you saw? The players were leaders, absolutely, 100%. See, we can lead in different ways. Now, I saw this probably 20 times before I saw this one. How many of you saw the cheerleaders? Now, they're not the cheerleaders in the formal sense with the, pom with the pom poms, but the high fivers after. You notice the high fivers? Ah, good job, good job. And they high fived the, lead, the coach, too. By the way, when you're a leader, it should give energy, it shouldn't take your energy. When you're doing what you're meant to be doing, when you step up, it shouldn't take your energy. That's one of the ways that you're, uh, you're you know, it, the transformation side will give you energy. Transaction side will take your energy, but the transformational side will give your energy. We can all lead in different ways. Now, let me give, give me three qualities. What's one quality you saw in this leadership? Any of those people operating with leadership? Give me one quality. Shout it out. Care. Courage. Courage, compassion. Did I hear compassion? I said care. Caring, yes, compassion. Persistence, Persistence. perseverance, confidence. confidence. By the way, how do you get confidence? 
You don't get confidence by sitting around waiting for confidence. You say, you know what, you can do this. I have a very strong, this is a whole different topic, but I've got a very strong opinion about youth and mental illness today and mental health. And one of the things that we do not want to do is try to rescue kids and make it too easy for them. We've got to step them up to the plate and say, you can do this, and I'm here with you, and you're not alone. So here's what I know about this group. We have a courageous leader here. We have a leader with compassion and caring. We have perseverance. How do I know that? Because you wouldn't see it here if you didn't have it in yourself. How is it that someone sees the perseverance and leads with that one? Just recognize if you see leadership anywhere, you have it in yourself. This is a tremendous group of leaders. Now let's talk about authenticity, which is about becoming a leader worth following. Knowing your authentic self. It's another RCMP story. I'm up in Inuvik last year, working with all the northern district, the RCMP, all their detachment commanders up there. But how many of you have ever been to Inuvik? It's one of the best kept secrets. I love Inuvik. Well, I got up there a day early, and this team of RCMP got me a dog sled on the Mackenzie River for a day. It doesn't get any better. So there I am on this dog sled. Now, these dogs are amazing. So they're kept in a cage, and when they, they're in a kennel, and when they, you bring that dog sled out, you have to anchor those dogs to the ice. They are bred to what? They are bred to run. They are born to run. Worst thing you can do with one of these dogs, send them to a work-life balance workshop. <laughs> they are born to be, be in front of a sled. <laughs> the instruction was, if you fall off, hang on, because they won't stop. <laughs> Chee, ha, they'll turn, just with a voice command. Now let me ask you this. What would happen to those dogs if they were kept in a kennel all their life? Especially if they'd had a taste. What would happen to them? Could you see neurosis happen? Dogs get, would, would dogs get mentally ill? Can dogs get depressed? Can dogs get anxious if they're not doing what they're meant to do? Now let's take a look at human beings. What if we are not doing what we're meant to do in life? An artist must paint. An author must write. A poet must read poetry and write poetry if they're ultimately to be at peace with themselves. A builder must build. What must you do to be at peace with yourself? That is your authentic self. There lies within every person, amazing animals. There lies within every person. By the way, they don't necessarily get along with each other. <laughs> you got to know the team. You learn a lot about dogs. There lies within every person where, when connected to it, we feel deeply and intensely alive. At such moments, there's a quiet voice inside that says, this is the real me. Now, this is the challenge. What are you doing to connect with that voice inside of you? That's the problem with these bloody devices. Because I'm going to take you down to a, a level here this morning where you start to connect with this inner voice, this authentic voice. And as soon as you have a break, you pick up your device. Now, I have no judgment, like Jeff, I have no judgment about that, because I don't know, maybe you've got sick parents at home. Maybe you've got a sick kid at home. Maybe you've got an emergency. You've got to be in, that's why I don't have any judgment. But notice how you pick up the device and you go right from here to where? To here. And notice how many of those, how many of those messages on your device are really important and how many of them are just urgent? How many of it? gives you fulfillment in your life, connects you to yourself. I'm 63 years old. How many voices do you think there are in this world that tells me how to be a cool 63-year-old? Now, how many voices are there that help me guide me to my own voice? And you wonder why we struggle in our lives today. Now I'm going to tell you about my daughter. That's the one on the right. But actually, I really want to tell you about the one on the left. My daughter's a school teacher, English teacher. But I'll tell you the one on the left. That's Enzo, Enzo Ferrari. Now we got Enzo in a, in a 
at the Humane Society in Cochrane. Now, Enzo is part collie, best we can figure out, part, part collie and part whippet. What are whippets bred for? Kevin, do you know? Running. They are bred to run. They are the fastest breed on the planet. They'll outrun a greyhound in 100 meters. Now, on a track, a greyhound will take them in a half mile. But on a, tra on a 100 meters, whippet. They were born to run. This dog was in a kennel for the first 10 months of his life. Never been off a leash. Out to walk one day, one in the, you know, once a day. It did not know it had legs. So we'd walk it, and every 10 feet, he'd just lie down. Couldn't get him to walk. We had to drag him to walk. My daughter says, that's the a, that's a dog we got to bring home. We brought that dog home. Took us a week. We set him outside without a leash. He'd just sit there. He'd lie down. Didn't know he could run. And one day, you know what happened? He got his legs. He found his legs. And he ran. And he ran. And he ran. He ran so hard, he strained his ligaments. Couldn't walk for another week. <laughs> but I have never seen such joy in an animal. And it's the same as human beings when we find the, our true nature. You see, this is what we talked about earlier. You got an accountable self, you got an adolescent self, and you got an authentic self. So this is about connecting to your authentic self, integrating that into your accountable self, and your adolescent self hopefully will begin to dissolve. It's the power of focus. The, the Japanese have a word for this. It's called ikigai. It's your reason for being. And it's a combination of your gifts, your passion, and your contribution that you make to the world. And when those three intersect, you have a deep sense of satisfaction. As Gary Zukov says, when the deepest part of you is engaged in what you're doing, when what you do serves both yourself and others, when you do not tire on the inside, but seek the sweet satisfaction of your life and your work, what then? Then you know you're doing what you're meant to be doing. How many of you ever had a performance review where somebody asked you, how is your sweet satisfaction? This is not something that we've had a conversation about, but we've got to start doing that in our workplaces. So let me give you three strategies to find your authentic self, because this is where your leadership capacity will live. Number one, you've got to have a daily practice to go within. Every authentic leader has some kind of practice. It could be a jogging trail. It could be a meditation path. It could be uh, prayer. What do, you, what do you do to stop and go inside? To listen to the voice within you. Because there's so many voices that are clamoring for your attention today. And my encouragement is to say, t take some time every day to think. To go inside and say, what does my voice say? Now, it's, people say, well, I've had my own business for 30 years. Surely you've been authentic. But guess what I've been doing in my business for 30 years? Client calls me and says, what do you offer our company? You know what I ask them? What do you want? And I give them what they want. And I can create great value. But then one day I wake up and I say, hey, what do I want? Where's my passion? What's my vision? What do I want to bring to the world? Beware the barrenness of a busy life. Now, this is interesting, written 2,500 years ago. Why would, why would Socrates think that busyness is barrenness? People say, everywhere I go, it's a badge of honor. How are you? I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. Worst thing you can say is what? I'm not very busy these days. What's wrong with you? So now we've got to act busy. Now we've got to pretend we're busy. Here's my question. Every time somebody says, I'm busy, here's what you ask them. Here's what you ask yourself. Is it a good busy? Now, the only person that can answer that question is who? You. You can't get that question answered from the world. You have to say, is it the right thing? Is it the right busy? It's an old and ironic habit of human beings to run faster when they've lost their way. How many of you ever been lost in the wilderness? I spent a lot of time in the wilderness. How many of you spend, how many of you ever been lost? Physically lost? The natural tendency, sir, when you're lost is to what? Panic. Panic. And you speed up. And guess what happens when you speed up? You get lost twice as fast. So what do you get taught in survival school? You don't need to have gone to, sur to survival school. It's just, it's, it's common sense, even though when you're panicking and your brain goes into fight or flight mode, you, you don't reason. You, don't, you, you have to reach, you have to access the reasonable side of your brain. And what do you need to do if you're lost? Stop. Sit down. Get your bearings. Find out where you are. And it's the most important thing you can do today, 
is to stop and get your bearings. What are your values? What's your purpose? What's the busyness about? <laughs> Peter Drucker, there's nothing so useless as doing something efficiently that should not be done at all. All right. Authenticity, what drives your life? A phone or a compass? For the first half of our life, we're driven by these devices, which is about appointments and schedules and goals and productivities and achievements and activities. And one day you wake up. Sometimes it's a little wake-up call, and you say, what are about our values and our dreams and our purpose and our passion and our legacy? Now you've begun to go into the authentic side because it comes from within rather than from outside. That's, by the way, where stress is. By the way, if you carefully consider what you want to be said at your funeral, you'll find your own definition of success. How many of you have sat still and actually written down how are you going to define success in your life according to your standards, not the world's standards, according to your standards? Don't ever resist an opportunity to go to a funeral because it'll remind us all that, you know what? None of us are going to get out of this world alive. We're all going to be there one day. And it makes you reflect about what really matters in your life and what kind of legacy you really want to leave. You've got to lead with a purpose, discovering your why. Let me take you through a little exercise here to help you clarify what your why is. Again, we could spend all day just on this one. Another video I'm going to show you. By the way, two most important days of your life, the day you're born and the day you find out why you're born, Mark Twain. So let me show you a little video. I love this video. It, it'll demonstrate the power of why. So the, the series is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what, the key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So break time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Got it. Not great. So here's what I want you to do. Go back to your elbow partner. One more exercise. This will be the last one. And what I want you to do is ask your elbow partner, what do you do? And then you're going to ask your elbow partner four questions. And why is that important to you? 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 And I want you to see if you can discover a kernel of a why for why you show up in the world every day. Have a conversation with the partner sitting beside you, would you? Thank you. Thank you for engaging in this. My, well, I, I have a, a very good friend for a number of years. We were in business together. And uh, he was, he was, his name's Jim Rieger. And he was the director of uh, Operations Canada for HP back in the 70s. So he reported directly to Bill and Dave. And they had this thing called the HP Way, which has been evolved into many cultures today. Jim taught me so much about culture from his experience working at HP. And H, uh, Bill and Dave had, a, they had about 30,000 employees back in the 70s. And they had a vision that every single employee had a why. They knew their why why they came to work, and how their contribution made a difference to the overall company. And the story goes that they had a demonstration where they went into a plant. Now, back in those days, they, they assembled mothered boards on computers by hand. It was literally like an assembly line, where you would screw pieces of the motherboard onto, a, onto the computer chip, the chip onto a motherboard. And the story goes that when they had a, a demonstration in this in the sem assembly line, a customer came and watched this process go on. And the customer asked the lady who was assembling these, mother, these chips in the motherboard, asked, what are you doing? And she s looked up with a smile on her face, and she said, this is very menial work, by the way, hour after hour, standing in an assembly line. She looked up with a smile on her face and she said, I'm saving babies' lives. And the confused customer in this tour asked her, what do you mean? And she said, oh, you don't understand. These motherboards, they're going into hospital units and saving into prenatal care and saving those babies' lives. She understood her why. This is what empowers people, and this is what engages people. Number two, probe deeply into your life story and reframe your ordeals. If we had, if we had you four days from now, if, we had, if I had you together for four days, I would have you define what are the moments that made you who you are today? What were the defining experiences in your life that shaped you and made you who you are? I would love to talk to Jeff one day. He and I have not had that conversation. What made you who you are today by the kind of person you are? If you didn't learn what you learned in a leadership training course, even though you may have developed some of those skills, what makes you who you are? There's a book that has had profound impact on my thinking about authenticity. How many of you know The Velveteen Rabbit? If you've got kids at home, read this book to them. Nieces, nephews, kids in your life, read this book to them if you haven't. If you don't have kids in your life, read this book to yourself because it's a metaphor of the authentic journey. And basically what it is, it's a story about a stuffed rabbit who comes to live with a boy and he finds a mentor. Because all authentic journeys, you have a mentor. And the mentor inspires him with a vision. And the vision is, one day, little rabbit, you can become real. And the little rabbit says, what is real? Real isn't how you're made. It's a thing that happens to you. It takes a long time. It doesn't happen all at once. And then he says, does it hurt? And the very profound answer to that question, sometimes. But when you're real, you don't mind the hurt. Becoming real doesn't often happen to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off. <laughs> Patrick, few real guys in here. <laughs> Anybody's been through the cancer journey, either their own or with a loved one, understands something about having your hair loved off. 
You have to, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair rubbed off, your eyes drop out, you get very loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all except to people who don't understand. Here's a question for you. What has been your journey to realness? Because this is what will earn your respect from people around you. You see, there's two kinds of leaders. Leaders who read all the textbooks. Leaders who have all the theories. And then there's leaders who have embraced their life and gone deeply into their life and had to face the darker sides of their life. I love to read about leaders who have made an impact. Eleanor Roosevelt, probably one of the greatest leaders in the last 100 years, did more to bring the world together after the Second World War than any political leader. And she came up with a profound statement every time you meet a situation, though you think at the time it's an impossibility, you go through the tortures of the damned. Once you've met it and lived through it, you find that forever after you're freer than you were before. How many of you can attest to the truth of that statement? Read the darkness that people have gone through. How she got abandoned when she was a kid. Could live with her mother and her grand, her, went to live with her grandmother and her grandmother abandoned her. And how she had to find a tutor that made her into who she was. Nelson Mandela, read his story, 27 years unjustly imprisoned. What's the first thing that comes out of his mouth when he leaves that prison? Let's forgive. There's a journey down. What has been your journey? For me, I have had to face depression in my life. I could not do this work if I had not faced the darkest, deepest pit of my soul. And at the time, it's hell. But when you see it through the other side, you begin to realize in light of time's perspective, it's actually a gift. If you hold it and can appreciate it later. My mother found this statement in my mother's will, and in my mother's journal after she died. Every parent, no matter how hard they try, will be both a blessing and a curse to their children. How many of you parents can relate to that? My hope is that my Children will appreciate the blessing, if not immediately, then later in life, and perhaps, more importantly, that they will take the curse and, like an oyster irritated by a grain of sand over time, use it a castle as a catalyst to build layers of character and understanding, thus producing a pearl. What pain have you had in your life that eventually turned into a pearl? This is the work of authenticity is to embrace this. Now, see, we live in a world where we honor going up. We all know that the highest peak on the planet is, eight, is Mount Everest at 8,000 meters plus sea level. And people who climb Mount Everest are very much revered. Successful business people who, you know, climb the next peak, get the next mountain. It's very interesting. I was in Banff. Uh, earlier this year, doing my four-day leadership retreat with executives. And uh, while we were there, there was a reunion of all the Canadians who climbed Mount Everest at the Banff Center. And I just kind of got the tail end as they were leaving. Do you know what the big talk was among Everest climbers? Pre-onset on uh, de uh, dementia. There's a whole rampant indicator that, that uh, there's a relationship between getting above the death zone and long-term impact on the brain. And it's not being spoken about. And it's not being written about. It has the same impact as a concussion. What I've begun to understand also is that the, what's less known is that the world's deepest point is in the Mariana Trench at more than 8,000 meters below sea level. It's virtually an inverted Everest. It's the journey down. The leaders that I have respect for have taken the journey down to the deepest, darkest parts of their soul. That's equally as valid as the journey up. Maybe, what's, you know, maybe it's been a single parent that has embarked in the dedication and perseverance of raising kids. Maybe it's working with AIDS patients. Maybe it's coming to grips with loss. When I work with law enforcement agencies, I'll tell you the realness is what our law enforcement agencies and our first responders have to deal with that the rest of society would, would uh, crumble under. 
and they have the strength to be there and face that. What has been your journey to go down? My journey also is the care of my brother. He was a rural physician for 35 years in Sundry. And in 2013, he was awarded Canada's, or Alberta's outstanding family physician by his peers. He went to Vancouver to receive his award. Four days before he was to receive his award, he collapsed in the arms of his wife. And he was given the grave diagnosis, a grade three anaphylactic astrocytoma, which is a brain tumor, the same one that Gord Downey has. And he knew it would take him down. I cared for him for three and a half years. I didn't do the heavy lifting. He had his wife and his two caregivers so he could stay at home and be cared for. But one day a week, I went up and spent with my brother. I did stuff with my brother I never thought I'd ever do. I massaged his feet. I shaved him. I fed him. I sat there. You know, he had asphagia, so he couldn't talk. And I would just sit there, not having a clue what I'm doing. And it takes you down to a deeper part of yourself. It was the rest note in the allegro of my life. If you don't stop and do this, you'll, life will happen to you. And I, I would wheel him around his hospital. And I would ask, and his patients would come out and hug him. His colleagues would hug him. His staff would hug him. And I said, what makes a great doctor? And the thing, the thing that makes a great doctor is the same, the same thing that makes a great leader. He cared. And it awakened in me. I used to think he had to write, yeah, I, I used to think he had to know something to write a book about it. What I've discovered is, if you want to write a book, you want to re learn something, write a book about it, and travel around the country and talk about it for 30 years. And uh, this is what uh, I came up with with this book about the, the role of caring. If you want to learn something, write a book about it, travel around and talk about it for 10 years. And uh, that's my passion around what caring means. So. In conclusion, folks, my whole model is this. You want to build a good culture? It's on the outside. These are leadership practices on the inside, but the core is leadership presence. It's about who you are as a human being. And, this, and my model is that you have to look at all of those, but if you really want to find and get to the core of people, you have to take the journey down. Authentic leadership is about who I am, who am I becoming, what's important to me, how am I unique, how does my work support the answer to these questions, and how can the darker side of my nature be transformed into my greatest gift? If you're interested in exploring these questions and want to go away for four days with a group of leaders, I would invite you to join me in Banff, where we get away for four days and we have an opportunity to do that. And if, it's about creating authentic communities to do that, and the next one's in May 2020. Folks, I will leave you this, my last slide will be a project that I've been working on since my brother's death. This is my wall of influence. These are the 25 most influential people in my life who have shaped me and make me who I, have made me who I am. This lies in my, is hung in my office. I have two questions that I want to leave you with. Number one, if you were to have a wall of influence, who would be on your wall? And what have you expressed to them to let them know the importance of them being on your wall? Second question is even more important. And that is, whose wall will you one day earn the right to be on? If you can come into every day with a commitment that one day you'll earn the right to be on somebody's wall, not because the wall's important, but because the impact is important, then you will create the kind of leadership that it takes to do what was going to be talked about here for the rest of the day. Folks, uh, you've been very gracious with me to allow me to go over my time. I know that I was asked to go until this time, and I just hope that my colleague Greg is doing okay. It was my, that was my immediate, he's doing okay? That was my immediate response is good, I always love more time, even if it's at your expense. So uh, I hope this was valuable for you. I hope you'll be in a reflective mood, and, I, uh, and it's put you in a reflective conversation mode for the rest of the day, and I appreciate this, and look forward to spending the rest of the day hanging out with you. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Thank you very much.